Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Manan Ahmed, and I wanted to welcome you to the Research Without Borders, Negotiating Constraints, and Open Scholarship uh, panel today. Um, thank you for being here. Um, what I wanted to do is just introduce all our panelists at one go. Um, each panelist will then uh, speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, and after that, we'll open up uh, for a discussion. Um, my name is, as I said, was Manan Ahmed. I'm a assistant professor in the history department. I am here primarily because I have excellent moderating skills. Um, <laughs> people seek me from far away. And I'm also very interested in the questions of open scholarship, in uh, how we as um, scholars or participants in a type of highly specialized knowledge production are restricting or opening up the ways in which our communication happens, who gets to read our work, who gets to think about it, who gets to um, enter into a conversation with us. So these are very real questions, both um, rendered in terms of our scholarship, but also rendered spatially, um, where we are, um, for example, at Columbia versus <clears throat> Harlem versus the rest of the world, um, which apparently exists outside New York. <laughs> so um, this event is... Um, the third of four events in uh, the speaker series for 2013-14 uh, and is co-sponsored by Columbia's Libraries uh, and Information Services Center for, uh, and Center for Digital Research and Scholarship, Scholarly Communication Program, as well as the Digital Humanities Center. Lots of centers. Um, so let, and we are the center of it all. Um, it is uh, my very, very great honor um, and privilege to introduce um, Leith Mullings, who is the Distinguished Professor of Anthropology at CUNY. Her research and writing focuses on structures of inequality and resistance to them through the lens of feminist and critical race theory. She has analyzed topics including um, the role of gender, religion, representation on health, social movements, uh, specifically on cities, um, wonderful, wonderful volume on the American city. Um, many of her projects have utilized uh, community participation, participatory methods in her, um, and have a number of uh, edited volumes. She um, has won awards, including for the Society of Anthropology for North America Prize for Distinguished Achievement in Critical Study of North America. And most recently, from 2011 to 2013, she served as the president of the American Anthropological Association. And uh, if I can p add a sort of a personal plug, her essay, Interrogating Racism um, Towards an Anti-Racist Anthropology in 2005 or 4, 2005, is a, is a must read for those of you who are interested. Um, Dennis Tennant is the Assistant Professor for Digital Humanities and New Media Studies at Columbia University in the Department of English and Comparative Literature, um, which, which is not a... A, a position that many English departments have, right? So, a, a unique position. He writes and teaches in the field of computational cultural studies, both as in the critical study of computational culture and in the sense of applying computational approaches to the study of culture. Tenen is senior principal investigator for Piracy Lab, an academic research collective exploring the impact of piracy on the spread of knowledge around the world. He received his doctorate in comparative literature from Harvard in 2011, um, where he co-taught the university's first course on digital humanities. And he's featured uh, most prominently um, nowadays and perhaps for the next few years on the main page of Columbia University. Um, <laughs> so it was a running, running feature. Um, Leela Prashad <laughs> is the co-founder and chief data scientist at Nigel. Um, in her role at Ni Nigel, um, she collaborates with organizations to help them tell their stories through data and mapping and opens two-way lines of communications and participation with both the communities she's working with and with the public. Uh, Prashad directed the 100 Cities Project at Arizona University until 2012 and is still active in urban research with the school. Prior to Nigel, she established and ran the water program for the environmental nonprofit Arizona PIRG and work with the United States Geological Survey's Earthquake Hazards Team. Prashad holds a Ma Master of Science in Geological Sciences from ASU. So 
Um, at the outset, please join me uh, in thanking the participants for being here today. And what we will do is uh, start with um, Professor Mullings. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming out. I would like to thank Rebecca Kennison and Lila Williams and the Scholarly Communication Program and the Center for Digital Research and Scholarship and all the other centers that were mentioned that I have now forgotten for inviting me to participate in a series with such a great title, Research Without Borders. As we know, in this age of global flows of people, capital, and ideas, the most impenetrable borders that are not are not always those of the nation state. It is often the less visible borders structuring inequalities of global north, global south, race, class, gender, and sexuality that constrain access to knowledge, production, dissemination, and control. This afternoon, I'd like to share some of my thoughts, uh, some thoughts about my experiences with respect to issues of knowledge production and and dissemination. First, within communities of scholars, and second, among scholars and their research subjects and a larger public. My approach is informed by my experience as immediate past president of the American Anthropological Association, and let me emphasize that I completed my term in November, so I am not speaking in any official capacity. My opinions are my own. And second, my own research as an anthropologist working in communities in Africa, the US, and Latin America. Wrong. As president of the AAA, one of the major issues I immediately confronted was the sustainability of its publishing program. And Rebecca and I have talked about this at some length. Uh, the AAA is an organization of approximately 12,000 members, one-fifth of whom work or live outside the United States. Membership rates are determined by a sliding scale, and journal subscriptions and our annual meetings are the main sources for operating expenses of the association. As we say in our publishing facts, the AAA is unique among scholarly associations for the range and breadth of our publishing programs. In addition to our flagship journal, The American Anthropologist, 20 sections publish journals in partnership with Wiley Blackwell. We belong to the World Council of Anthropological Associations. One of the major concerns of our international members is the hegemony of English, of Anglo-English anthropology, as they call it. As you know, many UK and European universities are perhaps even further along the road in contending with what Marilyn Strathern has described as an audit culture, a context in which the impact factor of citations and other metrics of questionable evaluative power are heavily emphasized in determining hiring, salary, and promotion. Several of our international colleagues have informed us that in their universities, publications in their own languages are considered inferior, with publications in English and, in, and published in American or English journals being the gold standard. They speak of global hierarchies and the core and periphery of, of power in knowledge production. While the American Anthropological Association is not in a position to transform these global relationships, we have established a Committee on World Anthropologies that is charged with broadening anthropology's presence internationally, but also with recognizing and debating diverse views in world anthropologies. The American Anthropologist now publishes abstracts in Spanish and up to two other languages, and in collaboration with the European Association of Social Anthropologists and the Canadian Anthropology Society and the Brazilian Association of Anthropologists, we have initiated uh, our first multilingual virtual webinar 
the sub and the subject of the webinar was language and anthropological knowledge, and almost 200 people from all over the world participated. But like other scholarly societies, we are very conscious of the inexorable transformations in the world of publishing and the issues of sustainability of our publication per portfolio is a major challenge. Through a survey administered to the membership, we identified our members' key values concerning the publication program. Quality. Most of our members want some form of peer review. Breadth. We're determined to maintain a range of publications. Uh, multiple publications actually reflect important interests and interest groups and different approaches to anthropology. Accessibility with respect to improving the availability of our publications all over. Uh, Anthrosource is distributed free of charge to historically black colleges and universities, tribal universities, and qualifying institutions in underdeveloped countries. 89 years of content has been ungated. Some of our journals, such as North American Dialogue, have for some time been digitally and publicly available. More recently, we have introduced a journal called Open Anthropology, which is a, public, a digital public journal which culls articles from across our publications into volumes focusing on themes. So, so far, we have tried to select themes that would be interesting to the public at a particular time. So we've done family and other arrangements, we've done violence, and the one that's just coming out is on health. So these articles are ungated for six months. And then finally, one of our premier journals, Cultural Anthropology, has now moved to an open access platform. But of course, our members are very concerned about sustainability, advancing research and continuing our diverse publishing program. However, the issue of how to address cost implications while maintaining our other values is a problem we have yet to solve. Most of our members, in keeping with the last phrase of the association's 1983 statement of purpose, quote, the dissemination of anthropological knowledge and its use to sol solve human problems, are committed to the broadest dissemination of anthropological knowledge and many to open access. However, the majority also strongly oppose author submission fees, or raising dues to a level that could support the operating expenses of the association. For the most part, cultural anthropologists do not receive large grants that would pay author submission fees, and many of us feel that an author, an author fee system would contribute immensely to the already existing inequality among scholars with respect to who is allowed to produce knowledge. Divisions that already fall already follow the fault lines of nationality, race, class, and gender. Armed with an analysis of our publishing program produced by uh, consultant Ryan Crow, the association is in the process of thinking creatively about new directions, including a gradual move to digitalization, a more rapid move to digitalized and open book reviews, and various experiments with open access. And we'll, I uh, feel I dodged a bullet. I'm no longer president, and <laughs> the next president's <laughs> going to have a lot to do. Okay. This, the second topic that I would like to touch on are, uh, concerns issues of knowledge production, dissemination, and use with respect to scholars and their research subjects. Though this is a deeply structural issue with critical implications, I think anthropologists have a better handle on this through the increasing use of collaborative research methodologies. Community-based collaborative research, which involves research subjects in issues of knowledge production, dissemination, and control, has a long history in Latin America, in African American studies, and more recently in feminist methodologies. It is now co more common in the United States, but when I did my first formally collaborative study in Harlem uh, in the 1990s, this study was among the first initiatives by a national institution, in this case the Centers for Disease Control, to award a large grant to a community-based organization 
to conduct basic b research. They would award them to you know, do other things, but not co to conduct basic research. This project analyzed the impact of race and class on women's health and reproduction in Harlem. We involved the Harlem community in the research through a community advisory board of 24 people representing the various elements of the Harlem population who advised us on all aspects of the research. We established community dialogue groups that discuss specific aspects of the research, such as sites for participant observation, questions for the survey, topics for the focus groups, and material to be produced. We held open community meetings at each stage of the research to present research issues and findings. And we would just hand out leaflets on 125th Street uh, asking people to come. We disseminated the results using various modes of communication, including books and articles in scholarly journals and lectures at scholarly meetings and medical and public health schools, but also produced brochures, fact sheets, and held neighborhood meetings. One such brochure, written to be accessible to the general Harlem public, explained health disparities, the need for research in Harlem, the methodology of the study, and most important, the ways in which community members could use the results of the research. In another project involving five communities in Manhattan, we produced brochures modeled on the Harlem brochure in English, Spanish, and Mandarin. Mandarin. Now, of course, we would make greater use of digital resources, though I'm not convinced that they would necessarily improve dissemination in all circumstances. And I know I should have uh, digitalized these, but my children were busy, so I, <laughs> so I actually brought um, some hard copies, which I will pass out for you to look at, and these are of the brochures, and I'd appreciate it if you would return them. Could you pass them out? So that's the brochure, and they're in various languages, and what you'll see is the way in which we try to address it in a language that anyone could understand. I am now involved in a project initiated by Charles Hale of the University of Texas, Austin, and Pamela Kaya at NYU to undertake a collaborative, comparative study of new forms of racism in seven countries in the Western Hemisphere. This particular project would be described as activist research, defined by Charles Hale as Quote, a method through which we affirm political alignment with an organized group of people in struggle and allow dialogue with them to shape each phase of the process, from the conception of the research topic to data collection to verification and dissemination of results. We've held meetings so far in the U.S., in Bolivia, in Colombia, and in Brazil. That's I think all these are Brazil. And we intend to develop, oh, Guatemala. And we intend to develop teams of scholars and activists drawn from organizations of indigenous and Afro descended people as well as from the academy. The goal is to engage critical race theory developed in both the North and the South to deploy the anthropological races of the anthropological approaches of comparison and collaboration with the intention of generating new perspectives, new theoretical perspectives on race and racism and the effectiveness of strategies used to address them. Our hope is that the data produced by this project is not only theoretically interesting but can be disseminated and used to empower our research subject subjects. The, African, the New York African Burial Ground presents another extraordinarily, extraordinary example of community collaboration and, how, and democratization of knowledge. Some of you may remember that in 1989, 
what is now known as the African Burial Ground, one of the largest colonial urban burial grounds discovered thus far, was rediscovered in Lower Manhattan as the General Services Administration began preparations to construct the Fred Weiss Federal Building. In 2010, <coughs> the National Park Service asked Donna Davis and I to, do, to conduct an ethno-historic study of community activists who were involved in a 10-year process of marches, protests, and direct actions to preserve and memorialize the site. After significant pressure from the community, Dr. Michael Blakey, who was one of five African-American biological anthropologists in the US at the time, became the scientific director of the African burial ground. At issue here were real questions of hegemony, of hegemony, of hegemony. <laughs> what is considered to be knowledge and who is allowed to produce it. For example, was race to be defined by narrow phenotypical indices or was a diasporic perspective to be applied? Blakey involved the community in developing research questions, and the kinds of research questions they came out with were very different than the kind of research questions that the scholar may begin with. They were interested in orange, or, or, origins of the people, the quality of life, rituals, and other modes of resistance. And scholars may be interested in that or they may not, but this is what uh, the people who uh, were concerned with the African burial ground were interested in. in. In 2010 and 2011, when Donna Davis and I interviewed a sample of the participants, even after two decades, they continued to be extremely emotional and sometimes cried while recounting how and why they devoted 10 to 20 years of their very busy lives to this effort. The bottom line was their intense awareness of the common practice of destroying and misrepresenting African American history. As one participant put it, quote, the burial ground is obviously not just about some people who died a long time ago, it's about people that all the history books tell us were not even here. When I say to people that New York had the largest enslaved population outside of Charleston in the 1700s, people are just floored. Another participant put it succinctly, the burial ground fought the lie. Not only that there were no black folks here, no slavery in New York, but that they resisted, created families, and created a society despite the boot on the neck. Perhaps the mo most important was their recognition that knowledge production is profoundly political, that the power to pr transform the future rests in part with the power to interpret the past. Thank you. Everybody, thank you for coming. Just give me a moment to set up here. All right, so originally I was going to do a talk about um, my research on pirate libraries, but I decided to kind of talk about something else, uh, and it's more of a personal story. And for about a year now, I've been an active member of, um, on the Skeptics Forum within the Stack Exchange uh, community. Does, is anybody familiar here with Stack Exchange or Stack Overflow uh, in particular? So a few people. Okay, so I'll... If, if you pardon me, I'll explain to the others what, what they are. Uh, now, the thing to know about Stack Exchange uh, is that it's a question, it's a community of question and answer forums, uh, of which Stack Overflow is the one that is the most popular one, uh, and it, 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 it is about programming and uh, questions about computers and such, this sort of thing. Uh, but there are many of them. There's one called Skeptics, which is, and that's the one where I'm active. Um, and skeptics is a community dedicated to applying the principles of scientific skepticism, which means mostly people, people are interested in debunking myths, superstitions, uh, pseudoscience, this, this kind of thing. Um, so 
Stack Overflow is larger than skeptics by orders of magnitudes. They have literally millions of, of, of questions and answers per day, or not uh, questions, visits per day, whereas this one is much smaller. It, and this community is small enough where the active members know each other by name. Okay? Now, my purpose here today, um, in this short time, is to describe this little, for, uh, this little corner of the internet, both as, a, as an ethnographic exercise and as a moment of self-reflection. At the very least, I hope to capture um, a snapshot of this quickly uh, evolving community. But also, um, I hope that we can draw some lessons uh, and be inspired uh, to think about uh, ideas that we can borrow from this particular community and, um, and the way we can apply them to academic publishing. Okay, so that's the plan. The idea of question and answer forums is, is, a, is an old one. From, from the early days of internet, uh, you probably have participated on some forums where you ask some question and receive some answers. Now, the way Stack Exchange has altered this formula is they, instead of promoting uh, kind of endless discussion, which sometimes is good, uh, Stack Exchange is set up to actually answer questions. They want to finish discussions. They want to find definitive, definitive answers. Uh, like other similar websites, uh, the skeptic st and stack exchange in general is heavily gamified. Now, what does it mean to be gamified? So gamified, when it's done poorly, it feels very infantilizing. You get little badges, little stars, little smiley faces, job well done. Um, and you get <laughs> reputation. You get reputation. Uh, but I think here it's done well. I think here it's done well. Uh, and when it's done well, what, what reputation and other gamification features do is that they promote some system of social filtration, right? So uh, here is, this is a snapshot. This is a snapshot of the uh, site from today. And you'll see that there are some questions there, you know, so tensile strength of bone and, and the Bible. Okay, that is a weird one. Are pets <laughs> as bad for environment as cars? Um, I don't know. Uh, does filtering cheap vodka improve taste? That's, that's a, we should all check that one out. Uh, was super glue invented to seal bullet injuries to Vietnam? So these are just questions from today. Now, what happens is, uh, the, the first thing is that the questions, you can vote the questions up. Basically, if it is an interesting question, and if the question is notable, there's some standards here of notability. So you can't just ask a random, you know, if I sit all day, will I get sick, something like that. You have to actually reference something that, was, uh, that is claimed in popular media or in a book or in a lecture or something like that. And you have to provide a reference. So good questions get voted up and bad questions get voted down. So that's the first, there is filtration on the side of the questions. And then at the same time, the answers get voted up and down as well. So good questions get voted up and bad answers, uh, good, good answers get voted up and bad answers get voted down. And finally, the person who has asked the original question can accept, can accept the answer as the definitive answer. And there, is all, there are also community standards. So for example, just like Wikipedia, Stack Exchange discourages uh, um, independent research. So you, you are much more likely, or you are asked to reference existing research uh, for, your, for your answer. This is not a place to do original. Uh, original resource, uh, research. Um, so points and badges, points and badges are the essence of gamification. Uh, they can feel, like I said, a little bit cheap. But in this case, what they did very right is that your reputations and the points and badges that you get are, are very strongly tied to your editorial privileges. Meaning, every time you do something that helps this community, whether you help edit the question whether you ask a question or answer a question, your reputation increases. As your reputation increases, you gain additional editorial privileges, right? So for example, at 100 points, you may be able, let's see if I can find, uh, there we go, that's, the, that's kind of the, the menu here. So at 75 points, you can set bounties, you can actually offer point bounties to other people to answer a particularly difficult question. At 100 pay, uh, points, you can edit the community uh, wiki, you can create chat rooms, 
uh, you can vote things down at 125 points. You can't do that just when you join. All right, at 300, you can create tags. Um, the important one is 3,000. That's kind of as far as I got so far. But th at 3,000, you can begin to vote to close questions completely. So questions or answers of poor quality, you can actually vote to get, get them out of the website. And if enough people with that level of privileges vote, that question gets, gets taken out. So it's, it's kind of, it's a model for, you can, you can imagine this model as a model of community editorial ship, right? That is, that is in place here. Um, um, stack exchange sites tend to cluster around communities of expertise like programming, physics, photography, and English language usage. There's one for historians. Uh, the skeptics community differs slightly from these, and that it is the form uh, for applying the general principles of scientific skepticism, as I mentioned. Um, let me tell you perhaps some of my most popular answers on this site. So uh, those are my answers. I've, I've had 36 answers. So one of the most popular ones is, do wild dogs use trains to commute to and from Moscow? And the question is, yes, they do. Uh, the phenomenon was actually studied by an be, animal behavior psychologist, and apparently they commute. They take different, they, they kind of tr transfer and return to the original point of departure. It turns out to be true. Uh, did only a handful of people in Europe know how to do long division? This was claimed in some recently published book. Turns out, no, not true. Is that long division was known and was done on the abacus uh, in the Middle Ages, just fine. Um, did the ancient Egyptians use 20-sided dice? Uh, yes, yes they did. There were 20-sided dice. Dice are incredibly old and uh, dice of kind of multiple, with multiple faces are found all over the place. There are some in the museums here in New York. Is graphology grounded? You know, study of handwriting? Turns out kind of pseudoscience, perhaps not. Do girls mature more quickly than boys? And so on. Right? There's some recently you can see that uh, I got some points for the question, is the Chinese government responsible for hacking US business? And so on. But you see, to get to 3,000, it's, it's, it's pretty difficult. You get about 10 points for an upvote. You get a few points, one or two points down for, for a downvote. Uh, and you get even less for asking questions. When you're the green over there, it means that the question was accepted as definitive. Having a high acceptance rate of definitive answers is, is considered good, good uh, in this community. Writing these posts is time consuming, I have to tell you. So some of these, let, let me see. So this is, this is did only a handful of people in Europe know how to do, lo uh, do long division. That's one of my most popular ones. Let's, I'm actually going to open it in the browser to let you see how that looks. Okay. So that, that is it, actually, on the website right here. All right, so you can see here's my, here's the question. Uh, on the bottom here, uh, this is where people ask to clarify the question. Uh, it's not really an area for discussion. It's, it's an area for clarification. Here is my answer. You'll see that it has fairly extensive research on this particular question. Uh, citing kind of many, uh, mostly academic references. Uh, and you see that it was accepted with 20 upvotes, which is pretty good for, for stack overflow. That's not a lot. For stack, for skeptics, it's a lot. Uh, and you can see people who, who uh, uh, comment on my answer and, and often suggest improvements or ask to clarify something and so on. Okay, so that's how it works more or less. So, this could take a few days. It, you know, probably the longest one took me up to a week, but it also sometimes takes a few hours. And the question you might be asking, why do I do this? <laughs> why, instead of doing other things, like writing a book. <laughs> so why do I do this? Why do I do this? And I try to answer it for myself. I do it, well, first of all, it's fun. It's pretty fun to take to, to do what we are good at, which is scholarship, and apply it to questions that are not exactly you know, our everyday research. So after kind of researching stuff uh, during the day, I go home at night and I research more stuff on a completely random topic, which is somehow entertaining. 
So, so that's number one. Number two is that I support the cause. I support the cause of tough-minded skepticism and debunking pseudoscience. I like that. Um, number three, and perhaps most relevantly to our conversation today, I do it out of a sense of civic duty. Most of the sources that I bring to bear on answering this question, uh, questions are closed, right? But for me, they're very easy to get to. JSTOR, PubMed, those are my kind of strongest tools, and I can search them very quickly, and they're paid for by Columbia University. So I feel a civic duty of exposing some of these closed sources to the wider world and to a, quite an international audience who does not have easy access to these resources. So I do, I do feel like this. And plus, I'm incredibly interested in the mechanisms of filtration and in what we can borrow from forums like Stack Exchange for academic publishing. So for me, it's kind of I'm, I'm looking at this community and studying this community um, to see what it can tell us about academic publishing. So what can it tell us about ac academic publishing? What do I like about this community? First is that it's quick. You publish right away. Now, of course, very, much of very poor quality scholarship gets published right away as well, but with time, it begins to sink, right? It leaves the front page. So kind of there are strong mechanisms of peer review and social filtration. Number two, it's visible. So as, as somebody who used to edit an academic journal, I know that most of the work that we put into academic publishing is completely invisible. Right? Whether it is you're editing or you're reviewing for a journal, you don't really get any kudos or any reputation for this. Here, your work is visible. Anything you touch, you get points, and with more points, you get privileges. Right? So, so this, this type of setup encourages virtuous participation. It encourages people to do reviews quickly, right? to, to edit other people's work. And because the point system is exposed and it's explicit, the economy of prestige is completely transparent, or most, mostly transparent, right? unlike the way it works in the academic world. So I like that. Fourthly, or whatever number we're in, efficient peer review filters. We talked about that already. I think it does, you know, you do tend to see high quality posts bubble up. And finally, you have connection. You have immediate feedback from the community who is reading and responding to your research. We can imagine, following this model, imagine an academic journal where you gain reputation for being a virtuous participant in that particular ecosystem. And when you are a virtuous participant, you get certain rewards. For example, your paper gets reviewed quicker, or your paper gets reviewed by other similarly virtuous participants. Imagine a journal where the editor is not just a random famous person, but the person who has actually put in time um, and effort into building up the community. So that's it. That is Skeptic Stack Exchange. You can find, yeah, thank you. Um, you can find a version of this talk on my, on my website. Oh, your talk, talk is over. <laughs> Good job. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers of Research Without Borders for inviting me here, and um, it's it's very exciting to be with uh, my esteemed panelists. So it's it's nice to meet you all. Let me get my um, presentation going. Okay, so uh, again, I'm Leela Prashad. Um, and uh, I am currently the chief data scientist at Nigel.org, and um, I'm also a, uh, a researcher on um, urban remote sensing using satellites to study cities. So I'm going to talk today um, with sort of both of my uh, both my interests, my academic side and the work I do with citizens and um, NGOs and nonprofits, and some of the data tensions between scientists and citizens, um, and these. Tensions are not new, um, as Dr. Mullings was showing. Um, you know, there's a, a rich history of thought about the academic community and 
getting the results of academic research to uh, impact communities where that research is conducted. So this question, um, how can data and research conducted at the academic level benefit people in the community? This is something that I'm coming to from my background as a geologist, geophysicist, um, and uh, working with the nonprofits and NGOs, um, and thinking about our, our technology the, today and the speed at which uh, data and information and knowledge are generated in different areas. Um, I'm going to walk through three different examples. Um, uh, the first to sort of illustrate some of the differences between uh, researcher-led citizen science and DIY science, uh, or do-it-yourself, guerrilla-style science. Um, so bird counts on one side and environmental imaging on the other. Um, and then uh, looking at communities that collect data on their own to, um, to uh, sorry, one second. So my second area, um, looking at communities that collect their own data and crowdsource, and how effective they are at uh, collecting this data uh, to address chronic problems like sexual harassment. And then thirdly, looking at efforts where there's extensive research that's been done um, on communities, as particularly uh, impoverished people, say people who live in slums, and how that research and mapping um, affects them, and how they're, are, there a, are the people in these communities able to uh, take advantage of that research, or is it a threat to them? So uh, just uh, t two quick slides about my background. The uh, remote sensing research that I've been a part of um, at Arizona State University has been focused on um, giving complex data sets, say like a surface temperature scene derived from a satellite, to urban planners and policymakers and other kinds of academics, say sociologists and, and cultural geographers, to help them make decisions. And so this was part of my uh, graduate research, but also some of the work I did as director of the 100 Cities Project. Um, taking information like this and combining, with, combining it with policy information um, and epidemiological data to look at the uh, impacts that heat has, say the urban heat island, this a concept of the city being hotter than the surrounding rural areas, what it has on people who uh, live in very poor areas of the city versus those just a few miles away where they can actually uh, modify their landscape. And this, for, for me, um, you know, being on this side of academia, coming into this as a geologist, um, I, I was very impressed at you know, the sociology, the, uh, the Phoenix Area Social Survey that was done and the connection back to the community. But even within this project, um, you know, there were some interesting tensions. Uh, this community at the top, we used to call it T15, and this one at the bottom, we called it you know, U21, these very uh, uh, you know, dehumanized terms. And when the people from these communities were coming to actually hear from us, we had to quickly change the names of those communities so we didn't offend the people who we were trying to benefit. And you know, so even in acad academic research where, thing, where you're trying to counter for these things, you know, there's, there, there's certain parts of that culture that keeps, um, that, that keeps the academics at a remove. And so on my other side, oh, I've uh, for the last few years worked with some colleagues um, working with nonprofits um, and helping them with their data needs. Um, and um, so seeing within groups from groups working on elder care issues all the way to water pollution um, and uh, climate change, some of the power structures within even these own organizations and the way that they think about knowledge and information and data and um, the way they connect to the people that they serve versus their funders. So this has been a good education for me um, in learning about um, just data and what, how um, organizations who are looking for social and environmental change um, use information. So I'm going to start with citizen science. Um, this picture is actually from a colleague, Dr. Lohman, um, who works with a group called the Tree Foundation. Um, and I, there's, I see citizen science uh, in two different areas. The first being um, research-led citizen science that's focused on collecting data for a larger scientific effort. Um, I'm going to talk about the Audubon bird count, but you're probably familiar with other uh, groups like Riverkeeper who do uh, uh, they train people on doing water pollution monitoring. And then on the other side, uh, citizens who see a problem and um, collect data and information on their own. They're doing science, and they are initiating that work. So on the uh, Audubon Society uh, side, um, so um, this is a, probably the gold standard for uh, citizen science. It's been uh, going on for 114 years. Many of you may have participated. Every Christmas, um, people all around the world uh, look in their backyards, go in the field, 
and count birds. And um, people are active participants. They are volunteering for science. The data are reviewed. Um, extensive publications have been done based on this data. And um, there's a, 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 you know, a panel, a research review panel, to make sure that everything is happening in the right way that the, the, data, are, um, the data can be published on. And um, people are trained. They're trained by scientists. Um, or, and um, it's, it's very, um, it, it's a controlled environment to make sure that data can be published in, in, in peer-reviewed journals. Um, as a sort of alternate, the DIY, do-it-yourself guerrilla science, um, this uh, concept's been around for a long time. I mean, you could call this uh, community activism, um, environmental justice uh, projects often have people out there collecting their own information. Um, this particular example is uh, one that's going on currently here in New York City. Um, this, uh, you may be familiar with the Gowanus Canal, southern Brooklyn. Um, uh, this very polluted area, um, and people who uh, live in the area have been worried about its pollution for a long time. So um, one of the groups that's involved is called the Public Laboratory for Open Science Technology, and they've partnered with a range of organizations, the Gowanus Canal Conservancy, one of them. This was a couple, I think last year. Um, the Public Laboratory uh, supports this kind of guerrilla-style do-it-yourself environmental science. They have kits that you can use to fly a balloon, fly a kite, uh, with just a digital camera, with some filters you can put on the digital camera to actually see more than just what you can see with your eye, but see pollutants in the water. And um, they consider themselves a, a you know a cutting edge research organization that helps individuals uh, monitor their own area and advocate for environmental problems in their communities all around the world. Um, so this is a picture of uh, the Gowanus that they took, and you know balloon mapping kit that you can get from the public laboratory. Um, they, uh, the publications from this particular project and other similar um, citizen science initiatives um, are a little bit different. The, uh, the work involved was, uh, was very high level. Uh, some uh, historians took maps and mapped out the old Gowanus Creek from 1766. This at the bottom is a thermal infrared image of some of the pollution in the water. Um, and they used this to come up with, uh, with proposed plans, so proposed porous cobble areas um, that could help uh, groundwater infiltration, reducing pollution into the canal. So, it, you know, they're producing things that are, that are high level, um, but they, and there are scientists, of course, these are very educated people, um, but they see themselves as uh, driving the science, that no one was looking at this area, and they, they, are, um, they are the ones who are the scientists here. Um, and so they are very proud of the fact that the EPA has come to them um, to, uh, to, to make community plans, to uh, plan for the redevelopment of this area. And they, uh, the groups together have this uh, digital library, and that's where they're publishing their data and their publications like this, um, like this proposed plan for these cobblestone areas. So um, that's, that's one example of uh, citizen science. Um, this, is, I, this is another area, it's also a data collection by the community, but uh, not a traditional environmental science focus. Uh, this is um, a project that we were a part of um, to map sexual harassment in Egypt. And sexual harassment, uh, statistics on sexual harassment are low for anywhere in the world, but particularly in the Middle East, there really was, were, was no information except for people who'd experienced harassment and knew it was happening. And very often uh, they were told, you know, especially in Cairo, that, oh, you know, you, you were wearing a short skirt or maybe this is just, you know, white women tourists. It's not really happening to good Egyptian women. Um, so this Egyptian Center for Women's Rights, starting in 2005, so before smartphones, before Facebook, social media, um, they started doing the study and they found that 62% uh, of Egyptian men admitted sexually harassing women and more than 80% were being harassed. Um, and so um, a colleague of ours, um, her, she was working for e this ECRW at the time, um, and her, uh, her belief was that, you know, actually it may be even women in full burqa, full of women who are very observant that are being harassed the most. And so um, we worked with her um, starting after this 2008 with some new technology um, with a open source package that allowed for crowdsourcing. So we built a website and we set up a mobile phone number where people could, after a, being a victim of harassment, could say on their mobile phone or on the website, this happened to me and where it happened. And there's a, uh, an Arabic version, but this is the, um, the, the English version. 
And um, we, uh, Rebecca, uh, who had worked at ECRW, made sure that we kept these categories exactly the same as the previous survey, so they could be comparable. Um, and right at this time, this crowdsourcing efforts were being done for um, disasters, say Haiti. Um, this is the same tool, actually, that we were using that this crisis mappers group uh, put together. Um, which they built uh, in the wake of the Kenyan election crisis in 2007. So um, there, this it was a very useful tool. Of course, crowdsourcing has gotten a lot of criticism, um, especially a tool like this. You could say quite a lot. This is targeting a certain population. They have to have a cell phone, um, and they you know have to think about uh, the fact that they were victimized and they are seeking help. So there's there's this is targeting a very small percentage of the population. However, it's the only data that are available now um, to understand sexual harassment in Egypt, in Cairo, and actually through the uh, Mubarak regime, through the revolution, and what's happening today. So it, what's interesting is that, so we started that website in 2007, um, and, and then um, uh, worked with them, and the women in Cairo who were running this project um, the map became less and less important over time. People are still reporting, but in fact, if you go to their website today, you won't find it easily because the map uh, uh, created a community groundswell, and they started to um, develop uh, programs and trainings and safe spaces within the city. So in the end, the technology was somewhat of a distraction for them. They were getting a lot of attention from the media for the map, and they wanted to talk about their community building. So um, they have statistics now, and it's all from that uh, crowdsourced data, which you can poke a lot of holes into. But the, the thing is, it is the only data set, and I know of no other data set about sexual harassment anywhere in that region of the world. So... Um, so that was uh, an example of you know a, a data gap that this community wanted to fill and um, and use for advocacy. So um, another example of uh, it, it maybe as sort of the opposite, an, an area where that has been thoroughly researched. But the question is: is that information coming back to the community? Um, vulnerable populations are studied by many groups, uh, you know, international development groups, governments, for a variety of reasons, um, many to try to help those people and serve those people. Um, slum mapping is one area that I've had some experience with, and it is both a threat and an opportunity for communities. It's something that um, participatory mapping, much like this, this picture here, uh, where people draw the resources in their community, the pathways, um, uh, the, the power structures. This has been going on for decades um, in anthropology. This is a, a very established process. Um, so, you know, in, in 2010, in India, uh, the, uh, the government planned to map slums with satellite data. And, you know, this quote, we plan to map the whole country so that we know about the slums in each city. You know, if you trust your government, you think that your government's providing you great services, you know, you'll think, oh, good, you know, we're going to get things. But, you know, I, I, if, if you read that and you um, are a group and you, or you're a person living in a slum, you know that this means potential eradication. You're always fighting as an um, undocumented person or a person living on, um, you know, unofficial land for your, for your space. So, um, so there, there are some groups that worked with t the technology available to deal with this. Um, this plan to map all of the India's slums is happening, and this process is called the RAY process. It stands for a particular uh, community. Um, so one of the organizations, a uh, very established organization, the Shack and Slum Dwellers International, um, uh, and in conjunction with one of their partners in India, the Social Society for Promotion of Area Resource Centers, or SPARC, um, put together a, a platform of very basic technology, GPS units um, using Google Earth to map their own community. So translating some of that participatory mapping they were already doing into digital technology. And this is, this is for the communities to understand themselves, to, 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 know, to know what resources they have. But this is also um, an advocacy piece so that they don't become eradicated or so at least they can um, have some platform from which to... Um, to to defend their where they live, and SDI, the Slum Dwellers International, is, is uh, nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize this year. Um, so, on the other side, who are the other people who are studying slums in various ways? Um, there's, you know, certainly many um, many social scientists who who study slums and vulnerable populations. As a uh, person who is familiar with satellite remote sensing. This is the kind of uh, satellite research that's done on um, on slums. So, 
um, using uh, it's. I've been in several workshops where people really would like to have an automated way to map slums because humanitarian groups want to know where the vulnerable population is. Planners and policymakers also want to know where those areas are for a variety of reasons, maybe to provide services, maybe to get those people to move away. So, you know, this is a, a, a this is one example of a pretty established process taking in um, satellite imagery, geographic information systems layers, running a classification on that. Um, and developing a map where the, I think here, the, this sort of blue, the cyan color are slums, and pink is not. So, you know, this, uh, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with this process necessarily, but, you know, if, if you go back to, uh, to the way that these people who live in the slums feel about their community, I, this, this doesn't represent that. These are just colors on the map. It doesn't show any of the complexity and the resources of the community that's alive on the ground. So it's, uh, this research is, as it could ostensibly be used uh, by people who are trying to support the people on the ground, but it's disconnected from them. Um, so one example of a project that uh, bridges, potentially bridges these two communities is a project called Map Cabera. Um, and they partnered with OpenStreetMap. They're a part of a group called OpenStreetMap to map Cabera um, in, in Kenya, a large, very large slum. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I'm not a part of their group, but when I, they were presented to me initially, it did sound very, uh, you know, people from the West coming in with GPS units and, you know, coming to, to help these other people understand themselves. It has become very successful. Um, it's been com mostly taken over by the people who live in Kibera, um, and there are multiple ways to access the map data. Um, there's paintings on the walls at, uh, in Kibera. There's also more traditional uh, community-based uh, mapping and, and planning sessions. And for everyone else in the world, um, you can access this data through OpenStreetMap. OpenStreetMap is kind of like a Wikipedia of Google Maps. Um, it's, uh, the, the maps are there of roads and streets and resources in the community, buildings, parks. And you can also take that information, take all of those shapes and all of that, those attributes and use it in your own work. So it, what this, and MapCabera has gone on from just mapping to being much more of a community-based group. So it sort of moved away just from the mapping technology. But the data are here and they're alive. So you can go in and you can see this at any time. You know, what I think would be great is if researchers like the previous slide, the remote sensors, uh, were to combine this when they did their, their work to show that there are people on the ground at a very basic minimum to, um, to, to map some of those resources with their satellite-derived data. So um, I, I have some general questions for discussion. And I, you know, I don't think that, I, I'm not coming from the perspective that the scientific community, academic community are, are evil in any sense, or that the DIY community is, uh, you know, stands to take over everything either. I, I think that there are um, ways that we can also look through uh, past research, decades, you know, anthropo anthropology projects um, that interface with the community. I think that we can look at our history and, and think about um, how we can take this new burgeoning DIY science and integrate it into the mainstream body of academic knowledge and vice versa, how those two can, um, how those two can, can uh, support each other. Um, Academic knowledge, the, the base of academic knowledge, especially in, say, a science, uh, say, a geology or geophysics area, um, it has the advantage of uh, a long history of archiving data, um, providing data to the community. I'm very familiar with NASA. So uh, going back 30 years, we've got wonderful uh, archive of, of satellite remote sensing data. It can be hard for the general public to get, though. So if you have a DIY science application that's uh, obtaining its own imagery, is that going to only just last for this one point in time for their advocacy piece? How can NASA uh, provide places for this kind of science to be within their archive, be within their repository? Um, and, you know, what, and I believe also that the uh, DIY science community can uh, learn uh, some rigor and some techniques from the academic community. Um, to help bolster their claims and uh, to, uh, to lessen criticism about their work. Um, at the same time, though, um, you know, should an academic work be evaluated on the impact it has on the community being studied? If, if I'm doing a, a satellite remote sensing project of slums and putting out some, uh, some, some land use classification images, you know, how well does that work? How does that work impact that community? How can they use that data, even if it's not the data itself? How does it go back to the people? And is there a way that we can evaluate that? 
Um, and, uh, it, you know, I, I think that, um, uh, I mean, some of this would actually mean changing our research methods and the way that people conduct their work. Um, again, I do think there's a long history of this. So it may be pairing the new technology and even this new concept of data and what data is to some of the uh, established processes of connecting with communities. I think, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we had uh, sort of really, really rich talks. Um, all three were, um, I, I think there, there were some commonalities, at least that came to my mind. Um, I think one, one thing that um, all of these talks were, um, all three of these presentations revolve around with the, the question of um, the relationship between scholar um, scholar and research, scholar and community, um, scholar and activism, and how we define the word scholar here, um, whether this is something that has to be <clears throat> understood in the more technical academic sense or otherwise. And I think the tension between these various roles that we all play um, within our community, within our, our effort to make a better ethical, more moral universe, and our, our need to disseminate our information, I think all three of these uh, presentations um, highlight them, I think, in a very, very productive way. So um, at this point, I would just like to open the conversation up um, for people um, to ask questions. I would also like to invite uh, the panelists to ask each other if they have thoughts on um, the presentations that we've all heard simultaneously. Yes, ma'am. We, we please uh, stand. Uh, They're broadcasting, so if you yeah, could, uh, go in, the mic. in the mic, so please. Thank you. Well, I, I wanted to thank all three speakers. It was really great. And I'm just wondering about the ramifications of uh, critical thinking. Because, for example, when you were talking about <clears throat> trying to crowdsource information about and be skeptical about things. It reminded me of Snopes and and it reminded me of an email I got today that evidently there's a email going around that the storm this coming week is a hoax. From what we've been going through, I, I'm not so sure about that. Doesn't seem like a hoax, but anyway, <clears throat> I, I would just love to hear more about the importance of critical thinking and how can we get students to to really see the importance of it since they're surrounded by Fox News and the New York Observer, which I do believe has been, had a vendetta about Schneiderman, so. I mean, for me, so I, I, if, I, if I can jump in, you know, part of the thing that inspires me about uh, Stack Exchange uh, is that, is that there's uh, 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 the feedback is pretty quick. Uh, in other words, many of our kind of, if you think about social f filtration in general, whether it's in, in the news or in academic publishing, it's fairly slow, right? So, um, so in the humanities, you might submit a paper, uh, a year is normal for review, this would not be unusual. Uh, and then if it turns out that your paper is wrong somehow or has has uh, misleading information it might take even longer to kind of get that sorted uh, right so I, I think kind of a small it doesn't answer the entirety of your question but the small answer is we can think of ways in which we can include these feedback mechanisms that improve the quality of our discourse uh, and thereby improve critical thinking whatever whatever that means but um, so. And I think I would uh, add to that that when one works with communities and communities of people that uh, really have a stake in what the research is, mm -hmm. uh, this argument has been made as far back by Eleanor Leacock and various other people uh, that uh, this kind of work produces, I think, much more pressure on the researchers 
to do good, accurate, critical work because it has real consequences and those real consequences are tested fairly immediately. And you continue to theorize and you continue to think about what you're doing uh, as it is tested in practice. Yeah, I, I would, um, I definitely agree with that. I, I think um, people, um, you know, outside of academia are, are very inspired by the, the problems in their own community. Um, and in being, um, being able to, to see that they are contributing to something, um, you know, whether that's something very mundane, like the bird counts or, you know, going out and, uh, you know, doing water sampling in your community. I mean, that, that, those, that kind of citizen science is very effective. Um, and this, especially in um, uh, getting people uh, aware of other problems. So it, you know, it, I think for younger people, especially, um, it, you know, it could be a driver to do some of their own DIY science or do DIY um, other kinds of community activism. Um, I do think that it, it can be um, uh, it, it can be difficult for people though if. Um, you're not being taken very seriously. You know, there's many environmental justice uh, uh, projects for people in the community have been trying to say prove a cancer cluster, something like this, and you know get derided by academics. Um, so I think that in that sense, some of that skepticism and you know what they, the the, the barriers they they see from the establishment drive them. Um, so you know, I, I I think that on both sides of that, um, you know, there's people participate on both sides. Thank you for your presentations. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts about who ultimately owns the, the research data. Um, your, your, your point about the uh, how can research methods be changed to incorporate local knowledge and give back data to the community. Uh, it seems interesting that we have the federal government now looking at open access and, and saying, you know, the federal you know, the taxpayers are paying for this research, the research data should be made openly accessible. In the DIY citizen science, how do you see that relating to this push for opening up the research data more broadly? Yeah, um, so I, I think, uh, that's a good question. I, I think that, um, you know, many data uh, sets have been available for a long time. That's probably what you would hear from a lot of these agencies, NSF, NIH, uh, well, anything health related, you know, certain uh, privacy issues, but at an aggregated level, NASA, I think the most difficult part is accessing that data, and it can be very obtuse. Um, I gave a training on NASA data last week to, to science journalists. There's 12 different data centers within NASA. You know, it just seems like a monolith. Um, I, know the, I know people there, so, you know, for me, it's people, but um, I, I, they can be the, these monoliths, and I think um, the DIY scientists I've, I've talked to, you know, they, they, they are rallying against that because, you know, they see you know, they're, they're getting these kits, they're doing this imaging, they're getting results, and they don't need established science. So it's, it's difficult. I, what I think is that the agencies that are providing the data need to, um, need to make it more accessible to people. I mean, in the, in the case of the Gowanus group, um, you know, the, the information they need, they'll probably would like the raw data form. But if, you know, you're talking about the community group in India, you know, they don't necessarily need the remote sensing image, but they do know, they do, they should know that somebody's making a decision based off that satellite imagery. So, it, you know, it, what they should get back probably depends on what their needs are. Of course, it's difficult to put together in the context of research, but. The type of data collected by anthropologists tends to be uh, complicated because uh, people uh, write field notes and the field notes and one of the primary obligations of the anthropologist is to protect their informants. And uh, accessibility to field notes can often be very dangerous for people depending on uh, the people you're working with. And in this Harlem study I mentioned, at one point, uh, for various reasons, the Centers for Disease Control uh, demanded our field notes. And of course, we had no intention whatsoever of giving up our field notes. And I was very surprised to find that uh, I had signed a contract. I thought I had a grant, and I didn't realize the difference between a contract and a grant. And um, in the contract was something saying that, that the data belonged to the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, so fortunately, because we have a code of ethics, I was able to call on our code of ethics and the necessity of 
protecting our research respondents. And then that brings up the question of what is data and what level of data uh, should be accessible to whom. So I think it's quite a complicated issue. Yeah, if I can, I think that the, the question of dat, what, what data is, um, there is, of course, an entire history of um, classificatory systems through which native populations was brought into control under the colonial regimes. Um, the poor that was studied in urban centers, um, the, you know, the type of pernicious and oppressive policies that various um, governments have used by collecting big data. So I think data is not a neutral term, even though it may appear uncomplicatedly um, in our discourses. And that goes back to the question of community that I think uh, uh, Leela uh, Prashad raised in her uh, presentation about how um, this data has, you know, different community, whether academic or non-academic, have access to the collection of data and what, did, what meaning to make out of it. Because um, none of this data is, of course, um, has, has its meaning um, uh, without sort of contestation. But any other questions? Well, I had a question of, of Layla. Um, I was kind of interested in all that data <laughs> and the <laughs> NS, uh, NASA, NASA. Uh, and I wondered about the various uses of all of that data under various kinds of uh, circumstances and whether people think about that. Yeah, I, I mean, just thinking about just particular, particularly NASA, I mean, it's, it's such a range of information. Um, it, it, there's uh, climate change vulnerability studies looking at um, uh, w potential areas for, say, water inundation, but then also uh, regions of soils that are becoming uh, uh, salty or saline. So, um, you know, I, I had but back in maybe 2007, I had heard a story of Indian farmers using some of this information. The uh, is, uh, farmers in Mumbai, their land was being taken by the Mumbai government. They were saying, you know, it's unarable, it's saline, and they were using some of this complex satellite data to show that their land was actually not saline. So, you know, there, you, you know the, is the, the range of information you can get just from this one particular uh, technology, the satellite or something flown on an airplane, um, this, these sensors, it's, it's, it's vast. So the kind of uh, research represented by this sort of slum mapping, it's very basic. You know, they're only really using the kind of imagery you'd see in Google Earth. You know, just something that you can basically recognize with your eye. So it, even scientifically, I often feel like they, you know, they, they could be doing a, you know, something a little bit more complicated, uh, but it's, it, it's, it's, um, and, and then when you even think about uh, very educated DIY scientists like these, this group at Gowanus, it's very hard for them to use the data. So, um, um, and then, you know, thinking about their own participatory mapping, you know, we've been using data like in these, these terms, but I don't think anyone in, in a community where they're doing participatory mapping thinks of that as data. Um, I, you know, in this context, it, it would be one layer with, within several other sets, say a satellite image of salinity. But, you know, how do the people in the community, how can they make decisions based on that without, you know, thinking of themselves as data points, um, I think is important. Um, your, your response just now um, triggered a question I was thinking about earlier, and that is the issue of capacity building in this process in, in terms of the scholars interacting with um, people in communities or communities connecting to each other to build skills that then would allow them to uh, engage in the data gathering. Yeah, I, I think that um, there's there's a lot of opportunity here for groups that have different skill sets to come together. And I, I do think that Slum Dwellers International has gonna get, done a good job with that. There's another group um, called IIED, and I'm not entirely, I can't remember the acronym, but they also, um, they, there's sort of a think tank for vulnerable populations, particularly slum dwellers. So I think that there, there are ways that groups of different skill sets can come together and um, do something like help, say, farmers uh, prove that their land is not saline and you know, do, do this kind of work. Um, and so in capacity building in that sense, um, the, also this participatory mapping, it's, 
it, you know, it's certainly not a monolith. I mean, even when people were doing this 30 years ago, just paper, um, there's, you, you have to be aware of power structures. I mean, just mapping a community is not uh, just an inert process. You know, you're d excluding people by doing that. So, you know, I, I think that there are probably, um, uh, it, I, I mean, I, I'm not an expert in this area, but there are, I think, um, uh, uh, outlines that could be used to bring in different groups that have different capacities and try to minimize, um, uh, try to understand different power dynamics. I, I mean, there will never be a utopia with this, but um, but I, I do think I, I see some um, opportunities there. And I, I think you know, I kind of mentioned the idea of virtuous participation briefly without expanding on it. But for me, that means that participation leaves behind kind of spillover effects that think improve everyone's lot, right? People who are collecting data and people who are analyzing data. Uh, there is now, as, as you probably know, there's great disparity in, uh, in uh, not just access, but the ability to do something useful with the data. Uh, there is problems of just literacy. Right uh, when when you go to a community like this or the community that the, the communities that I study, uh, if you collect large data sets, w will will this will this community be able to have the tools or the knowledge to do something useful for themselves without recourse to wh wh whether it's the government or the scholar or whatever it is? Right. So I think we have to think hard about what that virtuous participation may mean, whether as you're collecting data, you're also training people, you're raising the general literacy level on the ground. Maybe I can jump in with a question. Um, um, so this is rather a provocative question, and it goes back to the scholarly communication part of our thing. So uh, as you mentioned, Dr. Mulligan, you mentioned um, as part of your um, research in Harlem, um, uh, you mentioned a distribution model, which I want to ask if we have any better distribution model than that, uh, or is that the, which is the uh, brochure or pamphlet at the street corner. Like, is there a model for distribution <laughs> of scholarly research that has these two, um, two very, very important um, sort of uh, um, factors. One, accessibility to the community. You're standing on a, you know, 125th in Harlem. Um, and two, uh, accessibility in terms of language, in terms of you put your research on a brochure, um, you are simplifying, clarifying, codifying. So can we do better than the brochure? Is the brochure is the way in which we can think, we need to think about uh, non-digital methods um, because you know a lot of time pe we don't have electricity let alone mapping technologies um, <laughs> to figure out how to get access to you know to, to community to research so yeah I mean there were, there were a number of ways that we did distribution although that's that's the one I mentioned um, and I think one of the most efficient ways is to understand the structures in the community and the community organizations and to uh, effect distribution through those means. Because not only uh, do you get it out into various groups in the community, but then you also have people thinking about what to do about it. Research methods themselves are a way of, distri of distribution. We had something like uh, 20 focus groups, never intended to have that many on different topics, but people loved focus groups. And the reason they loved them was because they could get together with other people in the community and actually talk about the issues, housing, uh, health care, that, that was the topic of the focus group. So in a way, it, it, has, it has very much a ripple effect. Uh, I, there were also community meetings. There were also press conferences. There were also various points at which, uh, for example, Giuliani tried to take away money for, um, for the WIC program. And uh, so people got together in the community using some of the research that had been done uh, to actually oppose uh, Giuliani. I think also that uh, people use uh, diff different levels of people can use different aspects. We, we made up a set of slides which, which showed 
the community at a given point. And, what, and we use the traditional indices that are usually used, the level of unemployment, the level of vacant buildings, et cetera. And we showed them to our community advisory board, and our community advisory board said, um, well, you know, you have been giving us your structural analysis all this time about uh, why people are poor and other, uh, that poverty is a relationship, et cetera. Why don't you construct another set of slides that demonstrates the strengths of the community? How many people, despite all this, are employed? How many buildings, despite all this, are occupied? And so that's why the brochure that I showed you uh, actually had as a title, The Strengths of the Community. Now this is where they came into great conflict with the Centers for Disease Control, because the Centers for Disease Control actually had a rather pathological model of the community. <laughs> and um, no one denied any statistics. It was really what kind of perspective do you take on the research. Mm -hmm. So they suggested to us, why don't you go out and research uh, the number of complaints of police, of police brutality? Why don't you go out and research the number of mothers who are sitting in the offices of legal aid trying to get their children out of the, you know, problem tracks in school. So uh, what I found was that nobody disputed the need for accurate research. It was the context in which it was presented mm -hmm. and how it was used. And if you uh, present it in a context that people can use it, they will distribute it. Mm -hmm. Just my, I, I have a small comment here is that I think all three, all three talks, they feature some idea of embeddedness, where you do your research kind of on the ground, mm -hmm. directly engaged with the community, uh, and therefore you communicate by the modes and the media of that wherever you're embedded, right? So when you're online doing piracy stuff, you, you like tend to hang out at these forums, right? Bec why? Because that's where the people, that's what the people use as their primary research tool, and for them, that is the primary mode of communication. If you're elsewhere, maybe it's the pamphlet, if you're, it, it really depends. So I think this idea of thinking, thinking of research as embedded in particular geographic space, but also a particular mental space and a particular media space that suggests ways of communication that are appropriate uh, for the context. I think um, for me, uh, thinking about the, you know, standing on the street corner, giving out the pamphlet and you know, maybe making a, a, a understanding, you know, the community dynamics, the places of worship, the schools, you know, that, that makes, I, I can see that process. I think the, the, the online <laughs> communities that you've talked about, I think it's, it's less clear to be, um, and I participate in these, I, you know, I do Stack Overflow, Open Street Map, Crisis Mappers. It's, you know, the community is harder to visualize and I know there's been some, some recent uh, issues where people, well, you know, who, who is a part of that community and what are the, um, what, who's being left out and how can you participate? I think that, that there's questions around this and you know, I, uh, I know in the open street map, uh, one of the communities has had some problems with um, some, uh, some uh, issues where people were feeling discriminated against just on online listservs and there really wasn't a way to um, to, uh, you know, it, it wasn't obvious what that power dynamic could be. So, you know, the sort of the shifting, flowing nature of these new uh, forums online where we're participating and um, advancing questions and doing research, um, it's I, maybe in a few years, you know, down the road, we'll understand better. It, but I, you know, even though I live in this world, just the brick and mortar um, aspect of standing in a street corner with a pamphlet makes more sense to me. I, I was wondering about crowdsourcing. I think somebody raised that issue uh, and, the no, and the problem of critical thinking and, and having you know, really critical, uh, viable research. Uh, I wonder if crowdsourcing is uh, one step in a process. Uh, one of the things that interested me when I was uh, with the president of the association was that we began to take up the issue of adjuncts. I don't know whether everybody realizes it, but now 75% of classes in, across the nation are taught by adjuncts. 
most of them are, um, the vast majority are people who are just off tenure track, but are doing it full time. And uh, that, that this number has, uh, within the last 10 years, the number doubled. And um, this somehow crept up a, on a number of us. And there is a crowdsourcing website for adjuncts that people have been very active on. And it has begun to produce some interesting information that we cannot say the extent to which it is accurate and which is national, but it has given parameters through which one can then begin to ask questions about what's happening. Uh, and in addition to that, I think, has assisted in the organizing of this group of people. So I think it has a number of different possibilities. Um, there's a question now. Yeah, hi, I'm Alex Hill. Like, I'm at the libraries here. Um, and I deal with a lot of uh, humanities scholars from all range of disciplines. And, and one of the things that I also saw that your talks had in common is that all of you are presentists. Uh, you are working with, uh, with present day problems. I, on the other hand, have to deal with a lot of folks working um, with uh, the past, and not necessarily with a past that connects directly or evidently with the, with the present, uh, where the community is the stacks. Uh, some of these disciplines, like philosophy, are, are, are disciplines that are engaged in a dialogue that does not necessarily, I'm not saying this is a general rule, not necessarily engage with communities directly. And, it, and I always feel like I must defend that is scholarly practice. So going back to Manan's question about then what we're doing is how does it define a scholar? In your own experience, how do we come up with a, with a working model for what scholarship is to be in the 21st century that sort of reconciles the what we would may call pure research or historical research, or deep book research, uh, uh, with the type of research that is embedded? As you, as you guys practice, is there a way in which these two models can coexist, perhaps through a continuum uh, going forward? Well, I, I was going to say, I mean, my immediate response is, I, I don't think that the presentist, not presentist thing is, 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 is a, uh, at issue here, because you can imagine many historical prob problems that are particularly amenable to crowdsourcing, for example. So. Um, it just depends on the task at hand. So, so let's, let's do like the very, very canonical examples. Wikipedia, something like Wikipedia, an encyclopedia, which has small articles. That's a good task to crowdsource. Why? Because it's modular. It has tasks that you can work on it for 15 minutes, you can work for 20 minutes out of your day, and together achieve something greater, right, as the sum of its parts. Uh, a novel is not a great candidate for crowdsourcing because it's one long chunk. It's more difficult, it's not impossible, but it's more difficult to uh, uh, make it modular. It's more difficult to integrate the individual research, right? Articles just follow each other sequentially. A novel has to, the pieces have to fit in a much more finite way, right? So not a great candidate for that approach to scholarship, to that approach to crowdsourcing. So I would say we can think about historical questions that can be uh, addressed or studied in a more modular way, and some of them are like that. And then there are other questions which really require a single brain, sustained attention, long-term commitment, and that's not going anywhere either. And I, I would say that uh, all of these historical issues have relevant to have relevance to the contemporary context in various ways. I'm this semester. I'm teaching a class on uh, public anthropology, and I have several archaeologists who are students in the class, and they are very interested on, in how their work uh, on the history of humankind actually relates to the present, and and they find that it does in many important ways that actually make use of some of the kinds of mechanisms that we're talking about with respect to community and community collaboration. Uh, uh, I mentioned the African burial ground, for example. The whole question of how history is constructed and who constructs it, wherever it's constructed, in the stacks or uh, in digging in a burial ground, 
has very important implications for contemporary communities who want to get involved in the construction of that history. Uh, thinking a little about um, the, so the sciences, so um, on that citizen science side, um, it's researcher led. There's um, and so my view of history, you know, is, is Earth history. You know, it was one of the well, the first history class I took in college. So, you know, it, uh, but uh, it, there are beyond just people wanting to uh, look at their own environments or bird count. You know, there, there's some actually a pretty successful projects. Uh, there's a group called Galaxy Zoo, and uh, people can go and look at um, images of the universe and pick out um, uh, nebula and other sorts of uh, other features, other um, astronomy features. And you know they they're contributing to the, to science and you know a, a story about um, not just our universe but astrobiology. Where did we come from? So people come to that for a lot of different reasons. Um, and uh, you know, there, there's sort of more on the uh, combining uh, human history and, and the sciences. Uh, there's been projects to document how people um, responded to events like the Dust Bowl. So take combining, um, uh, the, I, I can't quite remember the name of the project, but combining uh, science data that was taken from that time. So um, weather, weather information, crop information, um, how the dust plumes moved, and how people then, um, how that affected different people. You know, was their house inundated with dust? Um, the, 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 these sorts of things. So starting to pair those two. Um, and on the sort of DIY science side, um, you know, I, I think that uh, people are very focused on the here and now, but um, there's a project called IC Change, um, and th this is sort of a journalism science project. They are interviewing people throughout the world and getting them to um, talk about how uh, climate has changed just in their in their lifetime. So I think that that there are some ways to to crowdsource this. I think they probably, from my perspective, fall more on the citizen science side that's researcher led. But I think there's some good DIY side too. On this question, yes. Hi. Um, since I work for an encyclopedia, I wanted to object to the idea that actually doing modular encyclopedia things in something like Wikipedia is easy. Hmm. One of the things that makes or that are sort of easier to do for citizens, you know, DIY, whatever we want to call it. Because one of the big problems right now that actually encyclopedias pose, especially on the internet, is the fact that you no longer actually have alphabetic access. So we actually now, by having them on the internet, you can do via hyperlinks and other things, you can actually dramatically change forms of exchange to knowledge that also dramatically increases the question of how our different bits and pieces are connected. And if you look at the editing pages within Wikipedia, you see that people massively fight over what goes in and what goes out. So I'm not necessarily sure that whether actually the definition of encyclopedias will survive the digital age, whether we will actually be dramatically forced to completely revamp how we understand encyclopedias and how they should function on the concept of on the internet. And I wonder whether the three of you could address two more things that I haven't heard. One is the thing that came a little bit um, up before is the question of preservation. And that sort of refers to a discussion that I have ongoing with Alex Gill. The whole thing that we have a lot of data produced right now digitally or sort of posted online or privately kept on computers but how many of these only digitally existent data will actually be lost? And whether we be completely sanguine about it and just say that's normal, that we always have a reading process as part of which only fractions of material will actually survive over medium term spans, or whether we actually should, when we start to create these data on whatever corner of the universe, should put more thought into it and who's actually financing that. And the other thing what I thought very interesting is when I read the title of this event, I th was wondering whether there would be more about sort of working closely embedded in one community and how are these communities are possibly actually transnational. So I, I have j just one minor correction is that I didn't say Wikipedia is easy. I said it's easier than writing a novel, which is probably <laughs> true. But it's not easy because there are you know, many Wikipedia-like clones failed before Wikipedia yeah, succeeded. So. Yeah, and the, the fights in Wikipedia, point is there are fights over, 
in, in Encyclopedia Britannica also, but they happen behind closed doors. So we have, right, so the mm -hmm. fact that th we see them is pretty good. So that's, that's just, but that's a minor thing. I, I do want to address, I think the major thing you're, you're bringing up is preservation. And I think we are kind of an infancy of the problem. Um, now, there, there are certain things that are, that are uh, there are good trends there. So for example, I think PLUS ONE uh, recently, uh, PLUS ONE is an open access journal for social science research mostly and science research. Uh, they, have now, they have now a policy where along with publication of the results, uh, you have to also submit the data. Right? And, and uh, uh, they're considering themselves as kind of an archive of not just the final publication, but the intermediary products of scholarship, like data, visualizations, and so on. But again, we're in an experimental stage. Right? So that's my one quick comment. And the second quick comment is that I do have much more, the original title of my talk was called Piracy as Peer Preservation. Uh, and and you know, think, I've been thinking a lot about pirate communities and, and the way they set up their infrastructure to ensure the long-term sustainability and preservation of their efforts. And I think, again, we, we, there are many ideas there. Some of them are probably terrible. Some of them are pretty good. But we can point is we can learn. These ecosystems, if you think about the journal uh, as a um, vehicle for preservation, has stayed relatively stable for a long, long time. And certainly, we can think of ways in which we can improve it and make it more of a, um, perhaps with the help of the library, uh, perhaps with the help of the very community of researchers that participate in these journals, uh, right? But we can think of ways to make sure that the data survives, the research stays accessible, and so on. And so, I mean, ancient, actually, ancient Eastern studies is much more advanced than many. Uh, Right, and I think some of the scholarly associations uh, are creating those kinds of vehicles. Uh, the AAA, I think, has a Gray Matters something portal uh, in which people can deposit all kinds of uh, reports that haven't been published, uh, field notes, various things. Uh, although I have to say, I wonder whether I really want to. <laughs> deposit my field notes in, uh, in one of these vehicles. On one hand, you don't want them destroyed. On the other hand, I don't know if I want them to live forever. <laughs> so. I'm sorry. Are you? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I do agree with you. Uh, Wikipedia um, is, I mean, it's ex exclusive of, of many different types of people. Um, and uh, the, you know, what Dr. Mullings was talking about at the beginning um, in her talk, a uh, little about who creates knowledge, uh, the structure of our journals and our peer review um, and tenure process. It, people, we, you know, we, there's been advances, but these are exclusive processes also. I think we understand more about the dynamics uh, within academia than we do Wikipedia or OpenStreetMap or these, um, any of these, you know, question answer type forums. There's a lot of people who aren't participating. Wikipedia has tried to address that. They have programs to get more women to participate. But you know, you still have to have a computer. Uh, you have to have time. Um, you know, you, you it's it's mostly white men who use it and younger white men. So that uh, colors the information that is in Wikipedia. I use Wikipedia all the time. I'm members of of a lot of these different forums. But you have to realize it's an exclusive community, um, and it's difficult to participate. So um, I think that people haven't. Um, these things have not really been studied because these communities are not taken very seriously. So, you know, I, I, maybe within the community, but it's certainly not been taken as seriously as exclusion within the academic, um, with the academic community. Um, yeah, on your, your second topic um, about um, the, the creation of data and loss, um, I, I agree with you. I, I, so I think that many citizen science efforts could benefit from um, uh, from the academic community um, opening up to them and allowing them to um, have their data and knowledge um, saved within their repositories. Because y you know archaeology very well. I know the physical sciences very well. Physical sciences um, has decades, um, if not, you know, for some, some types of data, centuries of, of, uh, of information for you to pull from. And it's a shame to have 
say groups like Gowanus uh, that I, I to think that maybe their their work will only last for you know maybe ten or twenty years or maybe less before it's lost. So it, that it needs to be um, uh, addressed, and I think that the uh, academia and our, our, our institutions like uh, NSF could do a lot more to think of citizen science not just as public outreach, but as um, these projects being science in themselves. You know, what that means uh, for, say, peer review and um, uh, making sure that, that information is at a certain standard, I mean, that's going to take some work, but it would be worthwhile to, to do. Um, and, and just uh, your, your last note about embedded in a community. I, uh, I mean, there's there's many good examples of people being embedded in a community. I, Matt Cabrera, I, I would t look in, look into that. Their their journey from where they started um, is also pretty 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 illustrative of this kind of work. Um, one last question. I don't know, my question was uh, about the use of the term slum. Was it ever uh, considered uh, wealthy areas as being a slum and or, uh, you, you know, that protocol for that termination, I mean termination, <laughs> terminology. And then also, I had two other ideas. One was about crosswalks, um, the application of this kind of research at crosswalks and then also on individual buildings uh, where a very localized, you know, even just one area and how that might be done. Sure. Um, so uh, slum definitely means lots of different things. And I think this is one of the problems with an automated detection of, of slums. I mean, a slum could be a refugee camp that was just set up yesterday, or it could be something like Daravi or, or Kibera. You know, if you go to one of these communities, I mean, you're, you're in a living, thriving community. So it that this term slum, um, I think, is fraught. Um, it's, it's but it is something that is used by humanitarian organizations and planners and policymakers around the world. So it, I I think that you're right, and it's that's why it's been difficult for these groups to figure out a way to do this automated with with satellite data. Um, and I'm sorry, your second. I, well, it was just you know, would you be able, as opposed to areas, uh, be more specified in just simply the cross crossing of those areas, like crosswalks. Oh. Okay. The, the thought, the idea that came to my mind with so many pedestrians being killed, and so then how to ameliorate but that. Maybe you know, if I can extend your question. So I think, and and this came up with in the conversation several times, kind of in in an underhanded way. Uh, so. Not, I mean, I mean it in a, like, it just, we didn't discuss it explicitly. But, but uh, so we are thinking about research that collects data, right? And that data could be used, as you mentioned, to do, to, uh, just as we can use it to study about the community, we can use it to control a community or surveil a community. And what you're suggesting is sensors, right? We can learn a lot uh, about a community or the city with, with smarter crosswalks or smarter red light cameras, or right? But at the same time, we have to think hard, and I'm, I, that's a question kind of for you guys, is how do we make sure that those very tools for learning about something don't become instruments of control and domination, right? So I, don't, I mean, I don't have an answer, but I think it's, it's, it's there. It's there in the, in the conversation mm -hmm. uh, today. Yeah, I think it's an, an excellent question. And uh, I don't know the answer either, but, I, but what I do know is that I think scholars have a responsibility to think about it. And uh, there's, there are issues of intention, which are perhaps more easily dealt with, but then there are issues of responsibility, where intention was not there. Uh, and you don't know how your work will be used. But I think we have the responsibility to think about what are the possible ways that our work can be used and are there ways in which our work can harm our research subjects. Yeah, I, I agree. There's definitely a responsibility um, on the scholar side or even the people in the community doing, doing the work in their community to, to think through these things. But I mean, it certainly would be a moving target for whatever uh, data or piece of information that's created, it could be used in a nefarious purpose or for at least a purpose you didn't intend. So uh, I, I don't think there's, there's really an answer, but certainly things are happening at a faster rate with technology and our interconnectivity. So it probably means uh, opportunities on both sides, threats and opportunities. So just to add something to that, uh, 
I think one thing we haven't talked about that we do need to think more about is the whole question of ethics. And dis we have disciplinary codes of ethics, but it seems to me that research has moved to such a different level that uh, it would behoove uh, scholars to really think more about what a framework of ethics is for a scholar who, who is working with human subjects. Um, I think that's, a, that's definitely a call, not just on the scholarly part, but also on institutional level, um, as universities or as libraries or other departments um, who produce, collectively produce research, the, the code of ethics for how that information then gets distrib distributed or who gets access to it, for example. That, I think, also is a purely ethical question for us to have um, access itself. So um, I just wanted to thank everyone for a stimulating and fantastic panel, and uh, thank you all for being here uh, this afternoon. <laughs>